cannabis common sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Our show is a production of our nonprofit organization, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, and its affiliated political committee, the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp. We have an exciting show for you tonight. Uh, guest Fred Gardner, the publisher of O'Shaughnessy's, one of the uh, medical journals on medicinal marijuana out there, is out with a special 10th uh, anniversary issue of California's medical marijuana law passing, and uh, with input from dozens of doctors around the state of California. We'll be talking a little bit about that. Uh, Tim Pate's here to provide his uh, musical accompaniment, to, along with Wolfie on the harmonica. We have Don Dupay, a retired Portland police detective, who will be talking about the waste of prohibition and ending adult marijuana prohibition, restoring industrial hemp, and helping medical marijuana patients. We also have some interesting hemp news coming up for you in just a minute after you see the infamous Dancing Cannabis Leaves. <laughs> First story tonight is from Little Rock, Arkansas. A cannabinoid agonist significantly increases ALS lifespan, according to a new study. Uh, the administration of the selective cannabinoid agonist AM1241 significantly increases the survival of mice with eye mitrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, and may ultimately lead to the development of new cannabis-based medications to treat the disease in humans according to preclinical findings to be published in the Journal of Neurochemistry. Investigators at the University of Arkansas College of Medicine reported that mice administered high daily doses of AM1241 after ALS symptom onset lived up to 56% longer than controls. The uh, authors wrote, quote, the magnitude of effect produced by AM1241 initiated at symptom onset rivals the best yet reported for any pharmaceutical agent, even those given pre-symptomatically. Uh, the findings from this study indicate that cannabinoid agonists may ultimately be developed as novel therapeutic drugs that can be administered alone or in combination with other agents at symptom onset for the treatment of ALS in human patients." End quote. Previous studies with THC report that it delays motor impairment and increases survival rate in animal models of ALS at rates slightly less than those obtained by the administration of low doses of AM1241. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and it's a fatal neurodegenerative disorder that is characterized by the selective loss of motor neurons in the spinal cord, brain stem, and motor cortex. An estimated 30,000 Americans are living with ALS, which often arises spontaneously and afflicts otherwise healthy adults. More than half of ALS patients die within 2.5 years following the onset of their symptoms. Currently, no effective pharmaceutical medications exist to stave off ALS's progression. Some investigators speculate that the endocannabinoid receptor system may provide against certain neurodegenerative disorders like ALS by exhibiting neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory actions to combat disease symptoms. The full text of this study, the CB2 cannabinoid agonist AM1241, prolonged survival in transgenic mouse models of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis when initiated at symptom onset, will appear in the forthcoming issue of the Journal of Neurochemistry. Our uh, next story is from the UK. A, a new warning that was uh, enacted a couple of years back uh, is consistently enforced, according to a new study. From York in the United Kingdom, 
A two-year-old British policy calling on police to verbally caution but not arrest individuals found in possession of small amounts of cannabis is only sporadically enforced by law enforcement, according to the findings of a study published this week by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. According to the report, British police issue warnings in fewer than half of all cannabis possession cases, despite the 2004 law change calling on law enforcement to cease arresting minor marijuana offenders unless they encounter special aggravated circumstances. The report also found that minorities were overrepresented among those defendants arrested for marijuana violations. The authors of the report state, quote, when cannabis was reclassified as a Class C drug in January 2004, guidelines were issued advising officers to give street warnings for most possession offenses, arresting only in aggravated circumstances. However, we found that street warnings were issued for under half of the possession offenses. They continued and said over half of the officers were against the downgrading. Many said that cannabis arrests often led to the detection of more serious crimes. In fact, we found this occurred in less than 1% of the cases." End quote. The authors did note that despite poor police compliance, the guidelines have led to a decline in overall cannabis arrests from a high in the Great Britain of 84,000 arrests in 1998 to less than 50,000 in 2004. They estimated that the policy change had resulted in a savings of three and a half million pounds or about uh, $690,000 or just over a quarter of a million officer hours among the 43 police forces surveyed. In 2004, Parliament downgraded cannabis from a Class B to a Class C scheduled drug in Great Britain, marking the first substantial change to the UK's 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act in more than 30 years. The full text of this study, Policing Cannabis as a Class C Drug and Arresting Change, is available online from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. That's at www.jrf.org.uk. Our next story is from today's Los Angeles Times. Uh, and uh, it's uh, written by Manuel Clauser, and he's the founder of the Reason Foundation, and is a Los Angeles lawyer. Uh, he filed the Reason Foundation's amicus brief in the Supreme Court medical marijuana case of Gonzalez versus Rach. Our uh, story from the Times is called, Let Them Have Their Pot. The Fed should stop harassing sick patients who have the legal right to use marijuana. In the fictional world of the hit show 24, federal law enforcement agencies are pouring every last resource into the search for a nuclear terrorist in Los Angeles. In the real world, federal agents apparently have so much free time that they can dress up in bulletproof vests and masks in order to raid clinics that serve patients battling cancer, AIDS, and other diseases. That's what happened last week as Drug Enforcement Administration agents stormed 11 medical marijuana dispensaries throughout Los Angeles and West Hollywood. We can all rest easier knowing that lollipops, cookies, candies, and candy bars laced with marijuana are in no danger of reaching seriously ill patients. Recall that 56% of California voters passed the Compassionate Use Act in 1996, making it legal for patients to obtain and use medical marijuana under the care of a doctor. A 2004 field poll showed that support for the law has grown since its passage, with 74% of Californians now in favor of allowing sick patients to use marijuana. In 2004, SB 420 clarified how much medicinal cannabis patients could grow and possess in California, and it allowed local governments to set additional guidelines. The West Hollywood City Council recently voted to control the number of medical marijuana dispensaries operating in the city. Last week, the Los Angeles uh, Police Department submitted more than 40 recommendations for controlling dispensaries, seeking to ban them from being within a thousand feet of schools and to require owners to remove all litter visible to the public within a hundred feet of the premises at least twice daily. The dispensaries also have practiced self-regulation. Yes, there have been poorly run dispensaries and others looking to circumvent the system, but the feds didn't focus on them. Instead, the raid hit one of the best run dispensaries in West Hollywood, the pharmacy where patients must present valid medical information verified by doctors, where the purchases are limited to one ounce, even though the law allows patients to possess eight ounces, and where patients aren't allowed to medicate on the premises, and where anyone caught with forged documents is detained until police arrive and charged with a felony. 
The pharmacy has been a leader in the treatment and education of medical marijuana patients, caring for patients suffering from everything from cancer to glaucoma to multiple sclerosis. It teaches patients about the effects of different strains of indica and sativa marijuana and other edibles and concentrated medicine in the form of oil to reduce the potential harm of smoking marijuana in its plant form. The raid on the pharmacy shocked West Hollywood officials who weren't notified of it in advance. West Hollywood City Council member Jeffrey Prang said, quote, we have worked closely with our community to ensure these establishments operate safely and comply with the spirit of Proposition 215, end quote. Special Agent Sarah Pullen of the DEA declared, and the DEA is here to enforce federal drug laws, end quote. In a 2001 case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the medical necessity of a patient could not be used as a defense against federal drug enforcement. The Controlled Substances Act of 1970 classifies marijuana as a Schedule I drug with no medical uses, making it worse in the eyes of the feds than cocaine and methamphetamine and many other drugs. In 2005, the court ruled that federal authorities could even stop a seriously ill patient from cultivating marijuana for her own personal use. In her dissent from that decision, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor declared that such, quote, overreaching stifles an expressed choice by some states, end quote. Justice John Paul Stevens noted in his opinion for the court that Congress could revisit its outdated law to deal with the strong arguments that marijuana does have valid therapeutic purposes. Meanwhile, the DEA can still bully its way past California law while ignoring its own spectacular policy failures. The DEA has failed to significantly reduce marijuana consumption despite breathtaking increases in arrests and incarcerations, and its recent efforts aimed at keeping medicine from patients are shamefully transparent attempts to go after an easy target. Marijuana dispensaries operate openly, and cancer patients are limited in their ability to evade law enforcement. The arcane classification of marijuana under the Controlled Substances Act persists despite the government's own actions and data to the contrary. In 1992, the Food and Drug Administration approved Marinol pills, which use the active ingredient in marijuana, THC or tetrahydrocannabinol, to treat nausea and vomiting. In 1999, the Institute of Medicine, part of the National Academy of Sciences, concluded that, quote, the evidence is relatively strong for the marijuana treatment of pain and intriguing, although less well established, for movement disorders, end quote. So what can be done? Congress must reclassify marijuana in accord with the standards of science and medicine. The law simply needs to be fixed. Until that time, the DEA should find better ways to spend its resources. Representative Dana Rohrbacher, a Republican in Huntington Beach, California, has called on the federal government to leave California and the 10 other states that have approved medical marijuana alone. His bipartisan bill, co-sponsored by Representative Maurice Hinchy, a Democrat from New York, was voted down by 264 to 161 in 2005. This reform is overdue. It should be an urgent priority for our new Congress to stop the Justice Department from arresting or harassing sick people in 11 states who have the legal right to use medical marijuana. Once again, that is an op-ed from the Los Angeles Times, printed today, the 26th of January, 2007. Our next story is from yesterday, from the Seattle Times. And it's the last story this evening. Medical marijuana mentions justice gone awry. This is a editorial from the editorial board of the Seattle Times. The benefits of medicinal marijuana have long been clear to those who suffer from chronic illness, and with the physician's consent, patients have had legal access to the drug for therapeutic purposes in Washington State since 1998. Too bad the feds don't recognize that. The blind callousness of the absurd war on drugs became once again apparent when West Sound Narcotics Enforcement Team detectives last week raided the Everett offices of Canicare, a medicinal marijuana advocacy group. Uh, whose leader, Steve Sarich, has appeared on this program. Confiscating 1,143 cut, cuttings, 195 uh, grams of processed cannabis, and private records of nearly 1,200 patients. The agents also raided the written home of another Canicare associate who only had six plants. Westnet 
is a multi-jurisdictional task force with the mission to, quote, disrupt and reduce mid-upper-level drug dealers, end quote. According to federal law, there's no such thing as medicinal marijuana. By state law, patients are allowed to have a 60-day stash, whatever that is. But only those are the, o those are the only limits outlined in the state law. Besides, if WestNet detectives are interested in busting drug dealers, there are a few crack dens around. Charges have not yet been filed, but a WestNet spokesman said, quote, everything's still under investigation, end quote. Maybe they'll provide evidence that can care sold to non-patients, and even if they don't, well, we'll sleep better at night knowing that those ravaged by conditions such as cancer, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, and hepatitis C won't have access to their medicine. It's not likely they'll die because of it. They'll suffer more than they need to, though, much more. So again, that's an editorial from the Seattle Times, published yesterday. We'll be uh, back in just a moment. We have Tim Pate and Wolfie here, ready to break into song and lighten the mood. How are you doing, Tim? I'm doing well tonight. How are you, Paul? Very well, very well. Well, I guess we should lighten the mood then, huh? Yeah. All right, I think I'll do a little music then. You can't light it up yet. Let's all be farmers And save the trees One acre of him Save a forest, please Let's all be farmers Get filthy rich Instead we're wrecking the planet and it's beginning to bitch on oh, Let's all be farmers The fear must stop This is the new, the old, the original Billion dollar crop Let's all be farmers And save the seas I can grow my own oil, thank you. Yeah, I hear hemp oil's clean. Let's all be farmers. And in the Exxon's rain, I can grow my own oil, thank you. And without the pain, let's all be farmers. Oh, now that you know. Well, who am I to tell you what you should grow? Let's all be farmers. Let's all be farmers. Let's all be farmers. As we watch that last tree fall, what will our cry be? We got them. Oh, we could have had them all. Let's all be farmers. 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 Jim Pate. Thank you, Tim. Welcome, Paul. We had a good article this week here in Portland in our uh, weekly magazine, The Willamette Week, called The Garden of Weedon, talking about how we all can be farmers now and how new things are out there. If you haven't picked this up yet, you should go get a copy of The Willamette Week. You can go online and get it to it. Just for the cover alone. Yeah, it's at www.eek.com. How are you doing, Don? Doing good, Paul. Good. Hey, Fred, you're hey, back. Fred. Hello, Paul. Fred here is the publisher and editor of O'Shaughnessy's. You want to tell our viewers who might not have remember well, seeing you before what O'Shaughnessy's is? 
Look at the middle camera there. there you go. Yeah, O'Shaughnessy, William Brooke O'Shaughnessy was the Irish-born, Scottish-educated doctor who introduced cannabis to Western medicine in 1839 with an article in The Lancet. He had uh, seen Indian doctors using it in treating a tetanus and other conditions. And our, uh, in California, uh, Dr. Todd McAria, who I know has been a guest on this show, is a, a, life, a long time admirer of o O'Shaughnessy, and he's the founder of the paper. And so we, we named it in his honor. O'Shaughnessy's aspired to be a, a conventional medical journal, but of course, in the given prohibition and this quasi legal situation we're in, we can't have uh, clinical trials of, of various strains of cannabis. So we're doing it uh, as best we can in a less formal manner than peer review medical journals. In the current issue, Prop 215 passed in California in November 1996. So as of November 2006, it had been 10 years of legality. So we decided, mm -hmm. to, sur we decided to survey the pro-cannabis doctors. And they have an organization. How many of those? There are about 25 associated with the Society of Cannabis Clinicians, a group that Dr. Micaria founded. And there are, uh, there, there are more every month and we expect perhaps 35 at, at the next meeting mm -hmm. the next they meet quarterly mm -hmm. and this survey was uh, not 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 good enough for a peer-reviewed journal because the questions the doctors never agreed on a unified intake form they didn't ask their patients the exact same question in the exact same way nevertheless even though they're all coming at it from slightly different angles, the answers that they got were very, very, uh, confir they confirmed each other. And the questions were very simple, straightforward. I'll read you some of them. How many patients will have received your approval to use cannabis through October 2006? What percentage had been self-medicating with cannabis prior to consulting you? Mm -hmm. And th in that, to that question, the answer was, above 95 percent. In other words, for all its success, and we, we wound up figuring that about 350,000 Californians are, are using, have used legally under Prop 215. 350,000, substantial number for, for a drug that theoretically has no, according to the government, has no medical use. But uh, the percentage that have been self med almost all had been self-medicating previously, which means that there's a vast population out there that has yet to try cannabis, has yet to discover cannabis. Has, the law enforcement has succeeded in inhibiting the vast majority of people I from coming that, forward. Yeah. Even though we've had a tremendous success, I don't mean to diminish it, they've had a tremendous success too in limiting the number. Because the truth is, as we know, millions of people could, could benefit from it. I, sure. I, I won't read all the uh, questions for it, but the bottom line the most significant finding has been that cannabis is the anti-drug. People on cannabis stop taking other medications. Sometimes entirely they quit sedatives and opioids entirely. Sometimes they just reduce their intake by half. I'll, I'll and that's got to scare the hell out the of the pharmaceutical yeah. companies. You know? Because that's what you're talking about, the, cutting back on the... The user pharmaceutical care. companies are well aware that cannabis yeah. is, it w would cut into their sales. And these pharmaceuticals, Lilly and Merck and a lot of them, they are fiercely competitive. They'll, conduct, they'll spend millions of dollars on studies trying to show that Prozac is somewhat superior mm. to Paxil in treating the elderly. They'll try and find some tiny little niche. Uh, so, of course, they don't want cannabis coming on the scene. Yeah. And we've, uh, O'Shaughnessy has had an article a, a few issues back showing that people say, well, where's the smoking gun? Where's the proof that Big Pharma is behind the prohibition? Well, it turns out that in December 1996, after Prop 215 passed in California, there was a secret meeting in Washington, D.C. of McCaffrey, the drug czar, Dan Lundgren, the attorney general from California, sent his top aides there. And there were representatives of the drug companies through their nonprofits, 
through the Johnson and Johnson Fund, executive of the Johnson and Johnson Foundation. And one of them said, and we well, used to have Johnson and Johnson cannabinoid that's what, medicine. They, I have several of those. In they our did, but now they are now. They, and there was, of course, Lilly and Merck and Squibb and Bristol. They were all yeah. had cannabis products. But at some point in the 30s, they threw in their lot with synthetics. There was a, as a higher markup. And uh, anyway, at the to make a long story short, at this secret 1996 meeting, the Johnson & Johnson executive says, and a California law enforcement officer writes it down in his notes, which we've obtained, says, the other side would be salivating if they knew that we were meeting like this. Well, who is the other side? Mm -hmm. The anti-prohibitionists, the people of California? Mm -hmm. This is a conspiracy. Sure. Government conspiracy, telling us how to vote, sending officials out to block. Well, that's what the White House Office of Drug Control Policy that's does. Right. They go into every state that has any sort that's of right. marijuana legislation and tell and people actively how, tell uh, you how to vote. Exactly. This Listen, we have a caller, and we do take some calls here. Let's go ahead and take one, and and we'll be back this in a second. Hello, caller, you're on the show. Hi, Paul, Tom, Fred. Hello. How are you doing tonight? Good. Real well. Good. I have a question. Uh, I'm going to be doing some outdoor uh, planting this year uh, in the Tillamook, Rockaway area, down at the coast, and I wanted to know what time of year is best to plant and how to protect it from some of those colder nights and days. Well, the best time is going to be in uh, uh, mid to late April. Uh, that's when the days stretch out and start being longer than 14 hours. Once, if they're shorter than that, they're gonna, the plants are going to start flowering. Uh, the plants are real resilient. You know, cannabis is indigenous to the high Himalaya mountains, and so you don't have to worry about the cold weather around here. They'll be ready in uh, early to mid-October, depending on the weather. I pull them before it gets real wet, or you'll have a lot of mold on your hands. But Well, uh, should I treat it with stuff like scorpion juice and uh, stuff like that in order to, to prevent the, the mold and stuff like that. You know, there's uh, uh, some sulfur. You can burn sulfur and that's something. I don't know about scorpion juice. I'm not familiar with that one. Mm. But uh, one, the best thing you can do to stop mold in a season is to go and shake the dew off your plants in the morning. And that's going to okay. slow uh, mold. The, the dew in the morning, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't dry out in the interior parts of the flowers later in the day, that's what causes mold. So the best thing you can do is to just shake the uh, the the plants off so the dew's off of it and it dries out a little more easily throughout the day. And how about foliar feeding outdoors? What part of the day should I Wouldn't do that? Wouldn't worry about that if I were you. I mean, you know, you can do it if you want. Uh, well, I'm a big fan of it. it, might, it you wouldn't want to do it during the flowering season, but it's something you might want to do during the vegetative season. But uh, what you want to do is be sure you have a lot of good organic fertilizers in your soil. All right. Yeah, I'd recommend yeah, rock cool. phosphate, uh, uh, various kinds of uh, animal guano or manure or things like that. All righty. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks a lot. Keep up the good work, y'all. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you that. These are actually some outdoor organic flowers we have right here tonight. I think this is a, a white widow bud, happily grown organically or in Oregon for medical patients. Yes. So if you have a question for us tonight, give us a call at 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. I guess we have a film clip we're going to run now, a brief clip from The Vortex. This is a, a biodegradable festival of life. This was a uh, protest here in the Portland area back in the 1970s. It was a concert billed as the first government-run uh, pot party. And it was actually the founding of the, the Rainbow Family. The Rainbow Family grew out of the Vortex. And here's a little clip from this locally produced video. We'll be back in a moment.
Long ago, in the summer of 1970, a remarkable thing happened in a quiet state park in Clackamas County, Oregon. This stretch of land along the Clackamas River would go down in history as the setting for the one and only rock festival sponsored by a state government. This five-day party would become a legend and remembered as Vortex One, a biodegradable festival of life. May 1970. National student dissent over Richard Nixon's policy in Vietnam was coming to Portland, Oregon. The president had gone back on his campaign promise to withdraw American troops from Vietnam. Instead, he decides to invade Cambodia and draft 150,000 more young people into the military. Universities across the country explode in protests. Demonstrations become even more intense when four students at Kent State University in Ohio are shot and killed by National Guard soldiers. More than 500 colleges find trouble at their doorsteps. Demonstrations, teach-ins, sit-ins, and student strikes disrupt campus routine. Students at Portland State University declare their own strike to protest the war and the Kent State shootings. Students barricade the streets around Portland's park blocks and shut the university down. On May 11th, the tactical squad of the Portland Police Bureau forced the demonstrators out of the park blocks with a demonstration of their own. The tactics that the police use have never been seen before in the city of Portland, and the violence shocks the community. How could this happen here? It's going to be a long, hot summer in the City of Roses. It was just a bloody afternoon. We called it Bloody Monday. It was uh, on May 11th. 1970, and they just came straight in. Uh, they uh, they told us to disperse. We did not disperse. We were going to make it a symbolic, you know, gesture. Uh, but then, you know, we thought we were going to be arrested. I now hereby command you all to disperse. Those that do not disperse will be considered under arrest. But they didn't arrest anybody. They just came in with their clubs, and they, they call us militants, you know. But there were these guys are militant, you know. They're coming in with their clubs going, oos, oos. Oof. And we're yelling, peace, 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 you know. And finally, the noises just overran into each other, and then they knocked us down. You know, we, we were circled in the first rank there, arms linked, and then just the, the full force of them, they knocked us over, and then they started clubbing. My mother, who uh, thought she was going to see... All right, that was an excerpt from Vortex One, which is uh, was billed in there as the first government-sponsored pot party back in the summer of 1970. Now, you had some first-hand experience as a police officer at that time. I was a detective in the 1970s when that went on, and the reason they moved that, all that out to McIver Park was to keep it away from the American Legion Convention, which was in town at that time. They didn't want them protesting around the American Legion, giving Portland a bad name. Right. But it gave them a good name. It did. And Some the Rainbow family changed. was born, or so they say. I was locked in a second floor command center uh -huh. in the police scared office. Scared to death of these people. Oh, really? <laughs> that was before you tried cannabis. That was before I tried cannabis, yes. I see. 
We have a caller. Let's uh, let that caller go through. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hi, my name is Will. Hey, Will. And I was uh, calling to see about the use of marijuana as a, a painkiller. Yeah, it works real well for that, especially CBD or, or leaf compounds when taken orally. Uh, t for pain, taking cannabis orally works better than smoking. And it's CBD in cannabis that's the most used for pain patients, not yeah. the THC that gets you high. But, yeah, it's, it's very useful for that. I would say over 60% of patients who have medical marijuana permits have them for a chronic severe pain condition. Yeah, it hurts when I pee. That sounds painful to me. Okay. So we're going to do a quick show and tell with our bottles here. Um, right here we have from Adamston, West Virginia, a cough and cold compound that contains cannabis. According to this box, it's in every fluid ounce there are uh, one half grains of cannabis. Directly next door we have a package from the San Francisco dispensaries back uh, circa 1996 uh, and 95. This is one of the original packages from the San Francisco pharmacies and then right next to that here we have a very interesting package from the 1880s it's a package and it's full of cannabis it's uh, Indian hemp uh, foreign it says right there the next to it this is a really interesting one it's from Merrill I think that company's still around isn't yeah. it uh, it's powdered extract of cannabis indica this was powdered hash it says this is a one ounce container so you could get one ounce of good key for hash, powdered hash, in this container. That would have been some good medicine. Then we have two products from Eli Lilly. This first one is their fluid extract of cannabis indica number 96. And here is another tincture number 17 of cannabis indica. So we have number 96 and tincture number 17, both from Eli Lilly. Right next door, we have a modern bottle of hemp oil that I picked up at Fred Meyer. I just found it amazing that they were selling hemp oil in, but you know, that's Kroger, really. They bought out that's Fred right. Meyer. It used to be a local store. Then I got this at the uh, Ashland uh, Food Co-op, and I've used it, and it's really good. It's hemp deodorant, natural, organic hemp deodorant made in Canada. Does it make you smell like bud? No, it's, it's seed oil, so it doesn't. Then we have uh, a hemp chocolate bar. Hashies. Now these are some of the neat candies that they come up with. Here is a uh, medicinal chocolate caramel bar. Sounds yummy to me. Uno dos. Uno dos. <laughs> and then a chocolate almond date bar with cannabis called your Dragon Bar. Those are some nifty candies out there for medicinal use at several dispensaries down California. And that's the end of tonight's edition of Show and Tell. Paul Stansford's museum, I refer to it It's here. the THCF um, Museum, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation's Museum, the ever-expanding uh, collection. you have an editorial for us tonight, Don? I do, Paul. We're talking about the same thing, basically, here. Let's talk about the words that we use to describe things and the word pictures that are projected from it. It's one of the favorite ways that the government uses to project the propaganda image that they want. For instance... They use the term social drinkers. It's used to describe what people do with alcohol, social drinking. And we get an image of usually young people having fun, relaxing and drinking their favorite brand. Yet there are no social marijuana smokers. We are described as recreational smokers or medical patients or usually just potheads. The government says we are recreational smokers, but how come there are no recreational drinkers, just social drinkers or drunks? Or is having a beer at a football game really recreational drinking? Probably, but if you pay five bucks for a beer, that's robbery. They never talk about social marijuana smoking, although I thought that most marijuana smoking is social. Recreational marijuana smoking seems to have a negative connotation, as in having no value. And I don't know what recreational smoking might be. I've never seen anybody smoking a joint while water skiing. That might be recreational smoking. I've never seen anybody smoking a joint while snorkeling. Stick a joint in the top of your snorkel. That might be recreational smoking. 
problem is that recreational doesn't belong in the same sentence with the words alcohol or marijuana. What they really mean is, uh, what they really mean when they say marijuana smoking is recreational is that we're just a bunch of dirty old potheads. I was really glad when I was able to get medical marijuana for my hepatitis C. At least that I had some status. I went from being an old pothead to being a medical patient, and I felt better about it. The government wants us medical smokers uh, lumped into a negative view, however. Why do we let them do it when we should be viewed truthfully as intelligent people that have discovered the benefits of the herb for all? We are the free thinkers. We are the ones that care about the planet and the creatures that are on it. We're the ones that want to return control to the country of the people that live here and take it away from the corporations that run this country. And anyway, why should the sheiks in Arabia be getting all the oil money when our farmers and our economy in America should be rightfully getting it? Besides, oil is finite. One of these days they're going to run out of it, and when the sheiks run out of oil, what are they going to do then? They'll probably run around the desert cutting each other's heads off like they did before they found out they had oil. And why should we be paying exorbitant amounts of money for a chemical medicine when we have learned, in spite of government restrictions on the study of cannabis in America, that it's wonderful medicine, it's cheap and easy to grow, and absolutely, absolutely good for the human body. We've talked here about a study in a Hebrew university that found that marijuana regenerates brain cells. Shouldn't that be huge news in America? Marijuana regenerates brain cells? The government wants you to think that your brain is fried like an egg so they can protect the pharma bastards that want to addict you and keep you hooked on their medicine. We've been lied to so long that we've forgotten marijuana is and always has been medicine. It's only museums like the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation here that we see these old cannabis medicines that were manufactured around the world and used because they worked. No negative side effects. And then we see old pictures of hemp fields in the south when we used hemp for rope and fiber. Old Ironsides, for instance, had 60 tons of hemp for sails and rope, and we grew it right here in America. If they succeed in keeping the truth about cannabis away from the multitudes for another generation or two, they will have succeeded in destroying the institutional memory of cannabis. The dictionary defines institutional memory as the accurate keeping of records, uh, memories, wisdom, and know-how for the use of future generations. I'll give you for instance. The government is now trying to erase the institutional memory of Hanford the contaminated nuclear reservations. In another 200 years, we'll all be gone, and so will the records, and will 500 acres of flat land on the Columbia River be attracted to some future developer that wants to put a resort there? What you need to realize, if you're 70 years old or younger, you've never been told the truth about cannabis, ever. How much longer must the government cover up the truth about this medicine, and how much longer we want to let them get away with it? What we need to do is fight them. We need to seek and demand the truth especially about our medicine. And that's the way I see it tonight, right down here on Hemp Street. Thank you, Don. Very good editorial. So, Fred, let's get back to talking about O'Shaughnessy's in your magazine here. So you've, you've surveyed how many doctors in this? There were uh, 21 doctors taking part in this survey. Uh -huh. <laughs> Some of them were speaking like your clinic represent several doctors are involved yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. in I've got a couple letters in there myself. That's right. That I'd written on behalf of Washington patients. I spent a lot of time talking to law enforcement and judges and courts throughout you, Washington State. Why don't you describe the gist of your uh, dealings with the Veterans Administration as you... Well in this case, as I recall, the Veterans Administration said that this patient who had cancer could benefit from medical cannabis, but they couldn't recommend it. And so uh, the, the patient started using cannabis and was subsequently arrested, uh, even though he was in the middle of his chemotherapy. Right. And so then he found out from his lawyer about uh, the clinics that are up there in the Seattle area, and he came in there and got his permit. And so the, the court wanted a letter to why this patient should have medical marijuana, and so that's the letter that I I wrote there. The situation of veterans is is really uh, horrific when the, when the VA won't. The PTSD is one of the conditions for which cannabis mm -hmm. is extremely mm -hmm. helpful. Yeah, and the Israeli army uses it. 
yeah. for uh, pay for their soldiers with PTSD. And it's it's should be a demand of the veterans groups that they get Unfortunately, access to Unfortunately, it can only be recommended for PTSD in the state of California. The laws in the other states don't allow that yet. Well, the Veterans Administration practices medicine by edict. This is what you will prescribe, this is what you won't prescribe. Yeah. It's medicine by edict. It's not medicine according to the Hippocratic Oath. I'm a veteran, and I'm I a veteran. twisted I'm my too. ankle yeah. and went into the VA hospital. And they, I was really painful. They gave me some uh, Vicodin, which helped ease the pain pretty mm -hmm. quickly. But they gave me also instructions on use, and part of that had to do with drug interactions. And it said the drug interaction with cannabis is was that it further reduces pain. That was the, the thing they gave to me when I, from the VA hospital. So I was happy to see a little honesty there. That you know what? We've had a caller standing by. Let's see if they're still there. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hello, caller. Okay. Well, that frees up the line. And if you want to call in at 503 Two eight eight forty four forty eight, and you're watching on the night of the twenty sixth of January two thousand and seven. Then call that number five zero three two eight eight forty four forty eight. Well, just one more point about vets and and PTSD. This is an issue that vets should organize around, and vets should. Uh, th there's a natural alliance here, and it goes way back to the to the Vietnam War between the anti war movement and the pro-cannabis movement. Mm -hmm. There's a tremendous pressure in our society nowadays. Everything is fractionated into the single issue. You know, you, you're a pot person, you're an anti-war person, yeah. you're a gay rights person, you're a black per You know, everybody's got their special issue that they're supposed to focus on. And we don't have a party that's unifying us to demand the basic changes that will resolve all our needs. Uh, we've got a start looking for that and, and figuring out how our issues, our separate issues really overlap and interconnect. Mm -hmm. I agree wholeheartedly. We're trying to do that. I'm looking forward to the end of adult marijuana prohibition and I think at that point medical mm -hmm. marijuana will really flower and we'll see industrial hemp as biodiesel fuel and fiber become predominant a few years later. But until we can remove those artificial barriers caused by the prohibition of marijuana. Right. There cannabis for medicine and cannabis for industrial hemp purposes is restricted. Mm -hmm. So one of these days we'll see change in that. I want to make an announcement here on February 11th, that's Sunday, February 11th, the uh, Church of Cognitive Therapy will be having an event, a potluck dinner. That's at 5.30 p.m. Uh, the potluck dinner is. I think the event starts at 4 p.m. And it's uh, February the 11th, uh, and they will have free anointing with the holy oil from Exodus 30:22. All who have a sincere interest in cannabis as a sacrament are invited to attend these services. They'll be held by the Church of Cognitive Therapy in conjunction with the Newborn Tribe and held at their cultural center. For more information, you can call 971-207-1881. That's 971-207-1881. And uh, it's at 3525 Northeast MLK here in Portland. That's 3525 Northeast MLK. And we have a caller. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Yes. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Very well. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering uh, what the average citizen can do against the prohibition of marijuana and to get involved. Well, you know, there are several groups you can get involved with, including... Uh, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation. Uh, you can write letters to federal congressmen. Uh, here in Oregon, all but one of our Congress people support the state's rights to Medical Marijuana Act. Uh, with uh, We should be expecting hearings and a vote on that. Last year, it came within 50 votes of passing. There are 50 new Democrats in the, the House of Representatives, so that could pass this time around, especially since Nancy Pelosi from San Francisco is a backer of that bill as well. So uh, writing letters to Congress people can help. Writing letters to your state representatives in uh, uh, Oregon, that's going to be in Salem, in Washington, it's going to be in Olympia, and then for our viewers over in Colorado, in Denver, you want to write letters to your local officials and urge them to back reforms to their state medical marijuana laws and talk about ending marijuana prohibition. Okay. 
But uh, you can give our office a call at that number that's there on the screen if you'd like to get involved. That's 503-235-4606. Or come down to our office. It's at Southeast 18th in uh, Portland. All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks for calling. We're down to just less than 10 minutes left. I want to one more time make a little plug about this week's Willamette Week. It has a very interesting story in there. Talks about medical marijuana in Oregon and the Oregon Normals, Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards strains. Talks about the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation. So if you want to pick up one of those. And I want to tell you that if you want to get involved in the movement to end adult marijuana prohibition, restore industrial hemp, or help medical marijuana patients, or you need a referral to a physician who can help you get a medical marijuana permit, we have a referral service for doctors throughout the state of California. Oregon, Washington, Colorado, and Hawaii. So uh, for folks in Portland, call our office at 503-235-4606. If you're up in the Seattle area, the Seattle number is 206-876-4606. Uh, uh, That's 206-878-1701. If you're in the Denver area, the Denver number is 303 303- 403-9996. That's 303-403-9996. And if you're outside of any of those metropolitan areas, but uh, you're still inside Oregon, Washington, California, Hawaii, or Colorado, then give us a call at 1-800-723-0188. That's a toll-free number, 1-800-723-0188. Paul, I can't help but comment about this Willamette Week article again because this is the same Willamette Week has got this beautiful cover. It's the same Willamette Week that referred to me as the pot-smoking grandpa when I ran for sheriff of Multnomah County. So they've gone a long ways from yeah. the pot-smoking grandpa to front-page uh, good publicity well, for us. Well, you know, Marijuana Leafs move magazines. They, put, they know that if they yeah. put a marijuana leaf along with a nude person yeah. of each sex <laughs> on the cover of the Willamette Week... That that's going to pull in a lot of magazines, and I bet they printed 30% more issues, given that they had those things going. I'm sure you're right. We have another caller. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if somebody that's on Medicaid could get marijuana if she lives in housing and yes. has fibromyalgia. Yeah, fibromyalgia definitely qualifies for medical marijuana. I would say probably... A third of all medical marijuana patients receive some form of Medicaid or Medicare or the Oregon Health Plan or something like that. And courts have ruled that patients in federal housing can use marijuana and they can grow for themselves as well. If you can't grow things very good, how do you go about getting it? If you then you have to name someone to grow for you or go to one of these local meetings like Oregon Normal has on the second Saturday of each month where they give out medicine and where caregivers can meet patients and patients meet caregivers that can grow for them. But the first thing is grow your own. If you can't do that, then it's best to find a family member or a friend, someone you know and trust who can. And then if that isn't going to work for you, then there are these other alternatives out there. For patients who, uh, who are validated, we have a forum on our website that only patients can go into they have to have a password and log in to get into that. Then they create their own account. And then they trade marijuana and, and plants and strains and medicine and things like that. Thank you very much. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Glad to help. And bye. Bye. So O'Shaughnessy's is available. This is the newest issue. This is the newest this issue. This is kind of like the, the main 10th anniversary publication to talk about how cannabis has been legal for 10 years in this, California. This contains a very thorough survey of what the doctors have really learned, mm -hmm. what conditions people are coming to see them with, what results they're getting, what unusual conditions they found. And of course, the, 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 one of the striking things is the tremendous range of conditions for which yeah. cannabis has proved useful. 
Yeah. Uh, you might remember Barry McCaffrey back at when this when Prop 215 passed. He made fun of Dr. McCaffrey. Yeah. Said, he this is Cheech and Chong medicine. Look at all these conditions that he thinks this he claims this can help. <laughs> well, we the scientists now know the research scientists now know the reason that it works on so many con conditions is that it's kind of the master modulator of the ho of the body. It's telling the whole endocrine all, system. Well, all the neuro transmitters that you've ever heard of, serotonin and GABA and dopamine, they're being slowed down or speeded up by the endocannabinoid system. Let's, let's picture a, an orchestra conductor facing the, the orchestra and going slow, hold it, hold it, okay, you a little faster. It's the, the cannabinoid system is the master conductor and it's toning everything down, keeping everything on an even keel. That's why it affects so many conditions from pain, inflammation, uh, gastrointestinal ailments, glaucoma, the list goes on and on, right. PTSD. Somebody who might call it a miracle drug. Somebody might. We call it the anti-drug. Yeah. Maybe we should go out with some music. Yeah, you know, I think we should. Is there anything you want to say in closing, Fred? Just go to the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, the THCF clinic, and get your copy of O'Shaughnessy's. There'll be a quiz on Thursday. <laughs> How about you, Don? You want to say anything in closing? It's been a wonderful week, Paul, and uh, I'm happy about this Well, I'm a Week article. Yeah, there was a great article in the Rocky Mountain Chronicle. And I finally week. got my Ai Chong book. Oh, yeah. Yep, speaking of Cheech and Chong medicine, yeah, they finally cracked down, but we'll talk more about that. Anyway, thanks for watching. We're going to go out on some music. Uh, see you next week, and remember to help us restore hemp. Good night. Right. Good night, Ramona. Do it, Tim.